spirits one God, Ameen. Uh, we have been meditating this whole month, uh, the month of Abid, uh, about the apostles and their ministry in the church. The, uh, some of you here were not with us uh, previous weeks, but uh, for example, last Sunday was all about the humility that is uh, uh, necessary for the servants of the gospel to have, and the humility that is, a, is the only source of blessing in our service. And so this month is, uh, is about the, the disciples and apostles of our Lord, but it's also about us, about us as the church, the apostolic church, and what it means to be disciples of Christ and successors of the holy apostles, and whatever lessons they had to learn uh, then before embarking on their ministry are lessons for us today also, very important lessons for what it means to be the church. And you got to understand that every parish, every Orthodox community that gathers in any particular place is the fullness of the church. With a bishop, of course, that is the successor of the apostles. But don't think of ourselves, uh, it's not a matter of numbers, it's not a matter of location, it's not a matter of uh, worldly talents or gifts. It's a matter of us being children of baptism, the body of Christ gathered in one place. And I say all of this, and I've been saying it now for the last couple of weeks, because I want you to think about this very importantly. It's one of the most important lessons and periods in the life of the church uh, that we go through once a year. This time of, 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 the, of the year, the month of Abib, we look at the disciples, we ask ourselves what lessons were they given in any particular gospel, and we apply that gospel to ourselves collectively as the church, and we measure ourselves up against that lesson. Are we living as a community? the way that the apostles were? Are we existing as the church in the way that Christ intends for the fullness of his church to be? If somebody came into this parish and had no idea what a church is, has never been to an Orthodox church, has never seen mysteries or priesthood or servants, will they get a full picture of what the church is by living among us, us, this group here? Um, and so this week, it's a very familiar gospel, of course, the feeding of the multitudes. We hear it so many times in the, in the life of the church, usually when it's a fifth Sunday of the month. But this time, it's not coming to us as a fifth Sunday. It's coming to us as the third Sunday of the month of Abib. And the lesson here as church is the way that Christ can bless the church beyond our imagination. And also the way that he uh, gives us a model to identify with who he is what he did, and how we can relate that way to the rest of the world. The, the multitudes followed the Lord Jesus Christ into a place that the disciples themselves called a deserted place. They followed him because they loved him and because his teaching was different. And they felt, uh, listening to him, that he was unlike anybody else. There were plenty of teachers in the cities and towns uh, uh, if, if it's not Jerusalem where the temple is, almost every major uh, uh, Israeli town had a synagogue, had a place of assembly where they could listen to teachers and the words of the Torah. But they followed him especially, uh, despite the inconvenience, because he was special to them. They loved him. And in return, the Lord loved them as well. And we see here that he loves them not just in the sense of a, of, of a teacher, you know, I, I teach in classes, and some of you were teachers before. I wouldn't care less if the kids don't have a lunchbox with them. Uh, if my kids come to class, or, you know, I teach grown-ups mostly, so if they come to class without food in their backpacks, sorry, go find something to eat. Uh, the Lord didn't care for them that way. He cared for them fully, for their entire being, not just to teach them words, not just to teach them theology and preaching, but also to nourish them and to satisfy their hunger. And that is why it's very important for us to take the ministry of the church, um, the aspect of it where we pray for the needs of the world, even the earthly needs, even the physical needs of our community and the rest of the world very seriously. And so, for example, when we gather today after church, we talk about the finances of the church. We talk about the need to have a festival. And there's a financial aspect of that that helps the church continue um, these are part and parcel of the ministry of the church. The Lord himself cared for the physical needs of his children. And when we gather for the liturgy, 
oftentimes there are some, everybody has a favorite part of liturgy and maybe multiple parts. Nobody really uh, uh, loves the, the litanies that we pray. Nobody thinks about them that much. They always kind of sound like background noise. When, when a Buddha starts, for example, and he prays for the sick or the oblations, or if you come to Vespers and he prays for those who have died, those that departed, or uh, uh, you know, if, if, if one of your two abunas decides to pray the litanies after the gospel and uh, pray for the peace of the church and the Pope and the assemblies, these are not fillers. These are not mere rituals that are, because it's in the book, we gotta do it, but it's a, 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 you know, a full expression of what it means that we are, again, the fullness of the body of Christ and the power that that gives us to pray for our church, for our Pope, our bishops, for the, the safety of our liturgical assemblies, and for all the other needs that uh, uh, we can pray for. And it is part of us following in the footsteps of Christ, just like he cared for people and their physical needs. He would care for those who are sick. He would care for those who have died. He would care for those who are traveling, uh, uh, coming to the disciples, for example, on the boat and, and quelling the storm. We too, as church, uh, do exactly as he did. And that is us identifying with Christ as the church, that the church would be not just apostolic, modeled after the apostles, but also Christ-centered, a church that is full of Christ. And so we pray for these things, we take them seriously, and it would be very good to train yourself if, uh, uh, if you tend to lose attention during these prayers, to think about them very concretely. When you're praying for the sick, think about a sick person in your life and what their life is like, and then Think about what it's like to be way more sick than that. Many more people sick out there besides the one or two people that you know. For praying for the departed, think about somebody who we've lost recently, some, a parent or a grandparent or something like that. And think about all the other people that have been lost or, or that have gone on from our life uh, in, the, in our community and elsewhere. Uh, anyway, so the disciples come to the Lord and they bring to his attention the fact that the people are hungry, uh, uh, that itself is, is their transformation from being disciples, which means students, people that are basically just observers, they're, they're, they're hanging around, just listening to the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe they follow him more often than other people do, but, but uh, essentially they are just watching him do his thing, they start to transition to actual fathers and bishops and shepherds of the church. Why? Because they become attuned to the needs of the church. They become very sensitive to what people around them need. But they're also aware that it is God, it is Christ that satisfies that need, that fulfills them and nourishes the people. These are very two very important things and I like to remind us whenever we have this gospel, uh, especially those of us who are servants, Sunday school servants, deacons, priests, those who are in the board, we always have to remember these two things. One, we have to be sensitive to the people's needs. Two, we have to be aware that ultimately it is not us that provide, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that provides, uh, even more than what we can imagine and, and we can uh, picture. Because they come to him with a very ready-made solution, right? It's a mundane, normal solution. Send them, there are shops you can go and buy, and that's what anybody would have done in this context. But the Lord Jesus Christ has a much bigger plan for us a much different uh, uh, solution. Oftentimes, when we come to the Lord with our problems, we have solutions of uh, behavior at meals, common, even expected, but then he imbues it with a special meaning, imbues it with a spiritual meaning, that he's not just an earthly father of an earthly family, blessing earthly bread and giving it back uh, to the people, but that he is the father of us all, blessing this heavenly bread, and giving us not just bread, but Himself, to be one with Him, as we say in the prayers of the liturgy. And so today uh, is not just about the Lord reminding us that He can fill our stomachs, which He does. It's not just about the Lord reminding us that He can teach us and to be the, the teacher in the wilderness that people follow, or that His, His spoken word itself is nourishing. It is also about the Lord giving us a model for how to identify with Him and how to be like Him in every way. Because just as the Lord blessed, we too can bless things in our life. Just as the Lord uh, uh, gave thanks over the bread, 
we too can give thanks uh, in our lives instead of complaining, instead of grumbling, instead of raising our eyes to the Lord with, with complaints. We can bless instead of curse. And just as the Lord gave back to the people and filled them more than they could imagine, we too can be a source of blessing. We can be the bread that fills people uh, in our communities, in our church, in our work, in our families, and so on. And when we have done this, when we have internalized that we don't come to church simply to be consumers, we don't come to church simply to receive a blessing or to receive uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in communion, but also to give. We come to give. And when we have regarded every context we're in as a church, the church here, the church back home in which you live, the church in your work, wherever you are as the royal priesthood. What's a priest without a church? The royal priesthood, wherever you are, it is a church. And when you've internalized that identity, then you're not just a consumer. Then you're identifying with the Lord himself, who is the giver of all good things. To him be glory, now and ever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.